I propose the Senate now adjourn. And if senators could leave the chamber in a timely and quiet manner, so I can call Senator Ferraventi Wells so she can be heard with respect. Senator Ferraventi Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to make some observations with respect to COP26. In the lead up, Minister Little Proud was very enthusiastic to quickly follow the herd, noting the International Energy Agency with its implied threats to developed nations for non-compliance, was busily coercing uh, the West into joining the march of folly. To give perspective and context to any policy dilemma that faced my colleagues, including their loyalty to constituents around Australia, it is worthwhile noting that Dr Bjorn Lomborg wrote in 2017, with a focus on US policies, about the 2015 Paris Climate Summit, adopting all promises from 2016 to 2030 will reduce the temperature in the year 2100 by zero. 0.05 degrees Celsius. Dr Lomborg further noted that the economic cost from pursuing these objectives will cost hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars in foregone economic output each year. Do I believe in climate change? Yes, is my answer. Because there has always been climate change on planet Earth. The only true crime, the only true climate constant on this earth is that the earth's climate has undergone constant change since time began. Climate cycles are integral to this constant change. The complex nature of climate science is still not fully understood. When one gets lost in the media jungle of climate change activism and alarmism, and when one becomes suspicious about shrill scare tactics and what I deem to be child abuse, then it is time to talk to a geologist to get the facts. Rest assured you will feel better afterwards and you will be able to explain to those children who have been the subject of climate alarmism that the world is not going to end in eight years' time, given the last hysterical prediction by the usual suspects. So COP26 was punctuated by the usual protesters wielding placards of down with capitalism, accompanied by the usual Marxist paraphernalia. One delegate threatened, pay now or perish later. It was a copybook socialist love fest. Lenin would have been truly proud. Now, the Prime Minister of Fiji, Frank Bainimarama, marama was the voice of reason. He advocated for the building of resilience against climate events such as building better seawalls, homes and schools. This reinforces the need for the Pacific Resilience Fund. So let's look at some of the facts. CO2 is not a pollutant, as some would have you believe, including our ABC. CO2 is a clean, colourless and odourless gas which is vital for the health of planet Earth. CO2 is plant food and it remains integral to the process of photo photosynthesis when trees and plants absorb CO2, thereby producing oxygen. Further to this, it is noteworthy that up to 50 per cent of the Earth's oxygen is produced by phyto phytoplankton in the oceans when the plankton absorbs CO2 as part of the Earth's natural process. Once again, I say to some ABC ju uh, act activist journalists, and I use the term journalists very loosely, CO2 is a clean, odourless, colourless gas vital for the health of our planet. Credible scientific studies by geologists record that the Earth's temperature prior to industrialisation was far warmer and indeed much colder as part of the Earth's natural climate cycles. Similarly, prior to industrialisation, sea levels were higher and lower as part of the Earth's natural climate cycles. The CSIRO noted in about 2016 that Earth's temperature had risen by one degree over the past 100 years and sea levels had risen 17 centimetres during the same period. Climate alarmism and climate emergency hysteria by the usual suspects have been based on questionable modelling which has been unable to predict with any level of confidence the natural cycles of climate variability. The UN climate body have acted on climate science consensus. Now, any dedicated and genuine scientist will tell you that science is not consensus. And indeed, any scientific research requires peer review, a vague concept for many who run with the herd. 
In that regard, true scientists note that a scientific hypothesis can only be validated if it accords with all data, namely the coherence criterion of science. Meteorologists like William Kinnan Month have noted that there are neither sound theoretical grounds nor observational evidence to support the argument that cha changing concentrations of atmospheric CO2 will have any significant impact on future climate or global temperatures. The human-induced global warming ideology is underpinned by the perception that the planet is static and that dynamic change only occurred once humans started to emit CO2 through industrialisation. Nothing could be further from the truth, exp explains Professor, Professor Ian Plymer. So according to Minister Littleproud, we should follow the herd and set off on a risky economic path to the nirvana of net zero CO2 emissions by 2050 as part of a PR stunt for the elites who attended Glasgow. Well, the only winners in that game were the elites, including the John Kerrys and the Andrew Forrests of this world, as they took their victory laps around the world in their private jets. The shift to the risky new zero, net zero CO2 paradigm will have consequences. I know I speak for the silent majority of the Liberal Party that will not support us for having broken our election promise on this issue. Net zero has been the political graveyard for a series of political leaders. Not only will jobs be lost and regional economies suffer, industries in general will be poleaxed, as indicated by Dr Lomborg, jobs will be shifted offshore mostly to China. The superb television advertisement of colour bond products from the Illawarra will be a dream of past glories when manufacturing industries fold and we rely more on China. Windmills and solar panels now made in China, noting China will ignore emissions targets as they ignore the rule of international law in the South China Sea, will continue to be imported into Australia as our home industries are further decimated. The continued diminishing of our industrial base remains a national strategic and security risk. Taxpayer subsidised Tesla luxury, luxury electric vehicles, oh yes, some made in China, will be the norm. Meanwhile, low income workers will not be able to afford the fuel for their internal combustion engine vehicles as they struggle with increased electricity bills, rising rents and costs of living. All the while, China continues to build coal-fired power stations, and in an answer to a question on notice, DFAT advised on 25 March that China has 49.1 per cent of the world's coal-fired coal power generation and 41.2 per cent of the world's planned coal capacity. Since 2000, the world has doubled its coal-fired power capacity after explosion growth in China and India. So where, where is the world pressure on China and India to reduce emissions? There will be a repetition of South Australian and Victorian blackouts and brownouts because of the unavailability of reliable baseload power. And whilst workers will not be able to afford the rising costs of electricity, petrol, etc., those advocating for the new paradigm don't want to mention nuclear power, the NIMBY principle. It is time to establish a domestic nuclear industry in addition to Lucas Heights, which helps to save lives through nuclear medicine. Low-level nuclear waste is finally on track for the future, noting that every hospital is a nuclear waste dump. In addition, some make the argument that operating nuclear-powered submarines without a domestic nuclear industry is a very high-risk venture. I agree with their point of view. The European herd of nations rely on nuclear energy as part of their energy mix. Even so, events that played out in the UK just before COP26 with respect to the unreliability of wind and solar witnessed the recommissioning of coal-fired power to save the day. This rescued baseload power as the UK headed into a northern hemisphere winter. Those pushing net zero need to explain their rationale for joining the herd mentality by locking in a plan of net zero CO2 emissions by 2050, which will have enormous economic impact on our country, especially the bush. It appears some have forgotten the basics of good policy 101. Facts plus logical thought plus deductive reasoning lead to good policy outcomes for the betterment of all Australians.
Senator Cox. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise tonight to speak on uh, Woodside Scarborough Pluto gas project, which will now be the most polluting fossil fuel project in Australia. A few hours ago, it was announced that the Scarborough gas project was given the final tick of approval. This is, in fact, a devastating day for our climate, our planet, and our future. The total pollution from Scarborough's uh, Pluto project will be equal to 15 coal parts fired power stations every year, and it will be worse than Adani. Over the last few years, modelling has shown that WA is the only state where emissions are rising. It's no coincidence that WA is the only state with massive exemptions for their gas industry. The Morrison government's so-called commitment to net zero is impossible given the gas projects that are being approved. I was horrified to learn that the approvals for the Scarborough project were provided by both state and Commonwealth government without assessing the damage, greater, the damage greater emissions will cause to First Nations cultural heritage, including the precious Murujuga rock art. The petroglyphs of Murujuga on the Burrup Peninsula are a globally significant First Nations heritage site, currently nominated for World Heritage Listing. This rock art depicts, uh, depic depictions of animals long extinct and for the first ever recorded recording of a human face. Hundreds of rock carvings are already being destroyed by the industrial pollution, nitrogen oxides that are when, when the dried particles mixed with rain actually turn acidic. Many other rock, rocks were removed to make way for the Scarborough Pluto facility under the historical Section 18 approvals, which have not been reassessed since 2007. The remaining Murujugo rock art is under significant threat from Woodside's acidic gas emissions. Thousands of tonnes of highly acidic gases are released each year from the gas-producing facilities. Peer-reviewed studies showed that this atmospheric pollution has increased the level of acidity on the surface of the petroglyphs by a thousandfold. This acid is slowly eating away at the natural varnish on the surface of the rocks that has been protecting these carvings for millennia, leading to the irreversible damage of the petroglyphs. The Scarborough Pluto project will only make things worse by adding more acid gas into the atmosphere around the Burra Peninsula. When the Pl Pluto facility was first built, Woodside was granted a Section 18 permit which authorised the destruction or removal of over 100 First Nations cultural heritage sites and many more individual rock carvings. These approvals have not been updated since they were originally granted in 2007, despite the new evidence emerging about the acid damaging the rock art. So where's Woodside's so-called so social licence now? I was deeply saddened to learn about the impacts that the Scarborough Gas Project will have also on the marine environment. Seismic testing, drilling and offshore gas producing operations will affect marine fauna, including whales, turtles and other marine species. Woodside is also planning to undertake dredging and dumping operations in the Dampier Archipelago, which is the richest area of marine biodiversity in WA. Not to mention the impact of the increased noise and pollution will have on our marine life, coral reefs, seagrass and fish. Despite these significant risks to cultural heritage and the ecosystem, the WA Environmental Protection Authority approved the Scarborough Pluto with no assessment of its environmental impacts. Emissions from the Pluto facility will be equal to around 5 per cent of WA's current total emissions every single year. But there's been no assessment of carbon pollution, and this is compounded by the fact that almost every environmental approval required for this project remains outstanding. Subject to unresolved legal challenges, requires updating or is behind schedule. How is Woodside getting away with half-baked appraisals or approvals, I ask? I'm certain that this has something to do with the donations that Woodside makes to the major parties, donations which are timed to coincide with the significant government decisions on the company's gas projects. It is not acceptable for any government to allow Australia's most polluting fossil fuel project to proceed without full 
public environmental impact assessment. Woodside has demonstrated time and time again that it does not take climate change seriously. The fact that they are now approved the Scarborough Pluto project, which will result in the release of over 1.69 billion tonnes of additional direct and indirect carbon, tells you everything you need to know about their climate goals, and they cannot be trusted. Woodside has a risk management strategy that amounts to a campaign of greenwashing, withholding information, regulatory capture and advocacy against action on climate change by state and Commonwealth governments. It cannot support the goals of the Paris Agreement and, give, and the green light to the Scarborough Project, which is massively increasing our emissions in WA. The science is clear and we cannot allow any new gas fields to proceed if we are going to have a chance at keeping warming below 1.5 degrees. Woodside's chief executive, Meg O'Neill, today claimed that developing Scarborough delivers value for money for Woodside's shareholders and significant long-term benefits locally and nationally. Ms O'Neill, how can this project represent value for shareholders when our major export partners like China, South Korea and Japan have committed to net zero by 2050. The International Energy Agency have found that the global demand for LNG will fall dramatically over the coming decades. If Australia continues to rely on a fossil fuel heavy export economy, which includes gas, it will leave both the government, fossil fuel companies and its financial backers with significant risk of stranded assets. Today's final investment decision for Scarborough will lock Woodside into a high pollution model that will not be profitable in a low carbon global economy. This will keep WA in the dark ages. First Nations people have been caring for country for 65,000 years. Successive governments have damaged cultural heritage in favour of big corporations like Woodside, and I am devastated at the thought that this climate bomb is going off in my home state of Western Australia. We are witnessing the destruction of country at the hands of Woodside, which is enabled by the WA Labor government. Senator Scar. I thank you, Mr President. And, uh, can I give my best wishes to everyone who's going to be involved in the Scarborough project, a uh, wonderfully named project, and all those who uh, are going to be employed, all the contractors who will have an opportunity to provide work, all of the suppliers, uh, probably across the whole of Australia, who will be uh, benefiting from, uh, from that project, and uh, give my best wishes to everyone concerned. Mr President, I'm delighted to rise this evening to assist the Chamber in finishing this evening on a very positive note as I talk about uh, a wonderful event that, was occur that occurred over the last two weekends in my home state of Queensland, the African Cup of Nations 2021. And indeed, it's fitting that uh, at the time I give this presentation that we have both the Minister for Sport, uh, my good friend uh, Minister Colbeck, and also the Shadow Minister for Sport, uh, Shadow Minister Farrell here, because I think both of you would have been delighted at the event that took place over the last two weekends uh, in my home state of Queensland, where the Queensland African Community Council, which represents 70,000 Australians of African origin, uh, convened this tournament, which had 23 teams—23 23 football teams representing 23 African nations competing for the Cup in Queensland, the African Cup of Nations. It was a wonderful, wonderful event. And I want to, and I should say 23 teams, three women teams as well. Three women teams as well. And it was uh, and I watched two of the women's teams play, and they played extremely well in very hot and sultry conditions. I've got to tell you it was uh, it was quite uh, hot watching them, let alone uh, uh, I can't imagine what it would be like playing. And there were three thoughts, reflections I had Watching this, uh, which, watching this tournament unfold. First, the outstanding leadership, outstanding leadership, which is provided by many people in the Australian African community. And I'll give you three examples, Mr. President. First, my good friend, Mr. Stephen Crillo, who has been a long-standing coach 
of the best United football team and was coaching the South Sudanese teams during the uh, course of the event. And Stephen is an outstanding Australian and has provided mentoring and support to countless young Australians on the football team. He's just been an outstanding role model and, in fact, it meant a great deal to me, Mr President, that he had the opportunity, opportunity to attend my first speech in this place. Secondly, I'd like to give my um, regards to my good friend Mr Kato Aochi. And he was the coach of the tournament. He coached the Congolese teams. And I actually saw him, I saw him coaching the Congolese women's team. And I was just so impressed at his coaching. I'll just give you one example. The goalkeeper on the other side, not the Congolese side, on the other side let in a goal which proved to be the, uh, the winning goal uh, for the Congolese women's team. And Kato took the time to go up to the goalkeeper for the, from the other side, who was quite inconsolable at letting in the final determinative goal, and actually comforted her and gave her support. The goalkeeper on the other team, and from my perspective, and I'm sure Senator Colby and Senator Farrell would agree, that encapsulates everything great about Australian sport. And the third, the third reflection I have was in relation second reflection, I should say, was the spirit in which it was conducted, the tournament was conducted. There was so much camaraderie, there was so much joy. It was all about the competition. It was all about the competition and enjoying, um, respecting and supporting each other on the football field. And it was just great to see. My last reflection was how it brought all these people together. It brought all these... Sport brings people together. Sport brings people together. So here you had... 23 teams representing 23 different African nation, nations, all Australians, all Australians coming together to share two glorious weekends on the sporting paddock. Just wonderful stuff, wonderful stuff, and it was great to see. So, lastly, uh, I have a quite long list, quite a long list of appreciations to give for those who are involved in this extraordinarily successful event. First, to Mr Benny Bowl, OAM, the president of the Queensland African Communities Association. Uh, Benny, you just do an outstanding job providing leadership to your community. And I, I really admired watching the interaction between you and members of the community on uh, last Saturday. You were just held in so much respect and regard. Thank you so much for everything you do for our Australian community. I'd also like to recognise the efforts of Abiba Andrea, the QACC PR and African Youth Support Council's coordinator. Abiba does a wonderful job in everything she does. She has great charisma, great leadership potential, and I think she will be a great leader in the community for many years to come. Seko Toure, the events coordinator. I've already mentioned Kato Aochi, the sports officer. Fred and D. Shimiyi, the vice events, vice events coordinator, Tracine Kitwanga, QACC's treasurer, also youth mentors, and there are some fabulous youth mentors in the Australian African community in Queensland, just great youth mentors. Agnes Mosseray, Lydia Jambia, Amok Kok, Henry Kon, Abal Ukunu, Paul Joseph. The Vice Secretary of QACC, Mohamed Osman, Mr Jimmy Bin, President of the Congolese Federation of Australia, Ursula Stablum and her partner were volunteers, Grace Edward, volunteer, Rachel Carabo, volunteer, Alakir Deng, volunteer, Henry Mosseray, DJ, DJ, and volunteer, and Jal Guguk, volunteer. And my apologies if I didn't correctly pronounce any of those names. I really pay tribute to each and every one of you. You did such an outstanding job as part of that event. I also thank all the linemen, uh, coaches, captains and the referees. And you have a sporting tournament. You have winners. So I'm going to have to give a call out to the winners. Uh, the male team winner was the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congratulations. I knew I was talking to the coach of the Congolese team, and their, uh, the biggest concern were Guinea and South Sudan, but the Congolese 
carried the day. The male runner-up team, the Republic of South Sudan, my good friend, as I said, Mr Stephen Crillo, um, an outstanding coach for South Sudan. Female winners, the Republic of Sudan. Female runner-ups, Democratic Republic of Congo. Best referee, Chris Ijo. Most valuable person of the tournament for men, Mr Fiston Changu from the Congolese team. Most valuable person of the tournament from the women's perspective, Ms Serena Ibrahim from Sudan. Top scorer for the males tournament, Mr Tariq Koko from Sudan. Top scorer from the females tournament, Ms Shazi, Shazi Suleiman from Sudan. Top goalkeeper of the tournament, Mr Matt Luger from Guinea. Coach of the tournament, Mr Kato Aochi, as I said, and the team of the tournament was in fact Zimbabwe, who collectively helped all the volunteers and helped bring this outstanding event together. So my deepest regards and respect to our wonderful Queensland African community and to all those involved in the immensely successful African Cup of Nations 2021. And very well done on all that pronunciation. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.